So today I'd like to talk to everyone about communication, the way we say it, the power of our words. And I'd like to use a little bit of your imagination, and I want you to think about your favorite story. It could be a book, or a TV show, or a movie. Just take a moment, and what, what is it? What, what, think about the characters. Think about the plot. And think about how it influenced you. How it changed the way maybe you thought about something. And whether it was a movie, or a TV show, or a book, it started as words. And that's what I want to talk to you about. The power of our words. The definition of done is a great way I like to start. Because in Agile, they have this concept of the definition of done. How do we know when we're finished? What does success look like? For this talk. So three of the things I want to talk about is the power of our words, the two key ingredients that make any communication successful, and three common traps that I find we can sometimes fall into and how maybe we can avoid them and make them better. So I started by talking about, think about what your favorite story is. Well, I'm a geek, so my favorite types of stories include comic books, superheroes, and I mean real superheroes, Superman, the Green Lantern, the Flash, people who had actual superpowers that could go out there and save the world. And they might just be in a regular everyday suit and then they could spin around super fast, ta-da, superhero uniform. Words have power. Superheroes aren't real. Superpowers aren't real. But words have real power. Words can be our superpower. They can create and they can destroy. You know, it's not just the pen is mightier than the sword. It's our communication. It's how we get from one spot to the other with the power of our words. If you've ever been a parent, or have watched children, they can be heavily influenced by the things that they see, by the words that they hear. You know, maybe they watch YouTube videos, and there's a YouTube video of Vsauce, and, and he loves to talk about science. And you might find that a, your child is watching this video and then becomes really interested in science for a couple of weeks. Or perhaps they start listening to yoga or exercise, and they get really into exercise. Or maybe, you know, it's, it's healthy eating. My, my youngest daughter's been a vegetarian now for over a year and a half because of videos that you know, help teach her about healthy eating. And when I was younger, of course there wasn't YouTube, but I know that a lot of the things that influenced me included things like Sesame Street and Mr. Dress Up, and then a little bit later, Highway to Heaven. In fact, it's shocking to me, re-watching Highway to Heaven this year, how many of my values came from that television show by the power of those words. I want you to use your imagination again. And I want you to think about walking into a meeting that you've been asked to lead or to facilitate in some way. And you're walking into that meeting and it's with an audience that you've never met before. You, you don't know them. And I want you to think about what are the two ingredients that if they existed in that meeting would almost guarantee successful communication. And you could quote them in the in the comments if you want, but what are those two ingredients? Well, I suggest the two ingredients that are necessary as a foundation for any success in communication are trust and cooperation. If you walk into that meeting and there's a guy and he's in the back, and maybe he has his arms folded, or he's stomping his feet. And you just know as soon as you go in to facilitate that the moment you start speaking, he's going to start speaking out against you. He's going to start telling you why you're wrong. He's going to start arguing with you, right? Immediately from the start of the conversation, it's dead in the water. It's not going to be a successful meeting. 
But of all the different ingredients that there could be, why only two? Why just trust and cooperation? Surely you can think of many more. And I'm sure there are many other things that contribute to success. But I think the formula is that trust plus cooperation equals safety. If you want to get somewhere, so if you want to have people involved, if you have people thinking and sharing their ideas, they need to feel safe. A person who doesn't feel safe won't share what they think, or they won't share fully what they think, or they'll stay quiet, or they'll say only what they think other people want them to hear. Because in that environment, they don't know you, they don't know the people that they're with, they don't feel safe, they don't feel trusted. They may not be encouraged to collaborate. They may be in an environment where they're supposed to compete with one another. And it's all about the politics of who's right and who's wrong. And those things take us away from safety. They take us away from positive communication. They take us away from successfully facilitating or leading that meeting. Okay, so you're thinking to yourself, big deal. Sure, Brad. Successful communication is about safety, and I get to safety with trust and cooperation. But then you say, how exactly do I do that? And then in my best Yoda impersonation, I say, do or do not. There is no how. And yes, I know the expression is there is no try. But the point is, is that in every communication that we have, the ability to get our point across, the ability to share information, the ability to establish trust and cooperation is going to be different. It's not going to be the same every time. There isn't one magical formula that will get us to the point of cooperation. So how do we do that? We have to experiment. Maybe come up with different hypotheses. Try out different things and say, well, does this work? And does that work? And we have to do it on the fly while, while we're facilitating. And it's not easy. It takes a lot of practice, but what worked in one situation won't work in another. And maybe we get there through trial and error. We learn this sort of works and this doesn't work. What I can share is some traps that I found that I fall into. And you need to identify for yourself what are the traps that you might fall into and recognize them. And maybe you can relate to these traps. So the first trap that's a big deal for me is ignoring body language and tone. And I've always had difficulty with body language. And you can ask people that are close to me when I have a conversation and I say something to them. So what do you think about that? Does that, does that make sense to you? And then maybe they'll fold their arm. That's fine! And then I say, oh great, I'm glad that's fine and then I'll move on to the next thing. And I'll completely, I'm basically holding my hand out saying, I'm not paying any attention to your body language, I'm paying attention to your words. And in my ideal world, that would just work. Because people would just say the things that they mean to say, and if it wasn't fine, they would just say it wasn't fine, and if it was fine, and I get a little bit facetious about it, because I recognize there's a, there's a mismatch there. I recognize there's something off in the way that response is coming, but then I ignore it because I don't want to deal with it. And after many years, I eventually had to put up a sign that said, yes, I was wrong, body language matters. And so does our tone, so does the way we say things. Does it, does it sound excited? Does it sound annoyed? Do we sound engaged? Do we sound scared? We have to pay attention to those things. And we have to recognize when we're having a communication with somebody, in the back of our minds, oh, there's, there's some sort of mismatch between what I'm hearing them say and the way it's coming across. And then you have to think, do I need to deal with that now? Do I need to deal with that later? Maybe I don't even need to deal with it at all, but you have to think about it and reflect upon it and figure it out in order to move forward. So, so a big thing for me is ignoring tone and body language. It's, it's a key part of the communication. And it's even more complicated when we have communications via email or we have communications via Skype where we're not sharing our photo, where we can't see one another's face because we don't know what that tone is, we can easily confuse it, we can go down the wrong trail, and two people can go completely divergent in their thinking and both believe they're talking about the same thing because they're not recognizing body language, because it's not visible to them if it's an email communication or if it's a Skype message. So a second trap that catches me a lot 
is failure to recognize my own trigger words. So trigger words are the things that push our buttons. The things that when we hear, give us a deep, very fast emotional feeling. And usually a negative emotional feeling. And everybody has different trigger words. So I'm going to tell you right now my key trigger words. So if you ever meet me and you're like, oh, I really want to get his blood boiling, here's how you do it. So my trigger words include should, shouldn't, can or can't, must, have to. Years ago, I worked to eliminate these words from my internal dialogue, from the words that I say to myself, because they kept me from being the person that I wanted to be. They kept me from being who I thought I could be. Because I would say them to myself and they would cause me to feel sad or they would cause me to feel upset. They would keep me from moving forward. So I said, you know what? I'm, I'm against those words. I think they're worse than swear words. But when I hear other people use them, my blood still boils, right? The, the emotions just build up so strong inside of me. And I'm like, oh, there's those trigger words again. You know, Brad, you shouldn't feel that way. Who are you to tell me how I should feel? Right? I just, I get annoyed very quickly. And your trigger words are different than my trigger words, or different than the next guy's trigger words. So sometimes when we're having conversations with people, we may accidentally use one of those trigger words. And we may step on the trust and cooperation that we need, not intentionally, but because we don't recognize those words as trigger words the way the other person does. And they may shut down, or they may become more reserved, or they may quickly become defensive. And when you recognize things happen, you need to say to yourself, oh, I think I used one of those trigger words. I don't know quite what it is, but reflect back on that. What could that be? And recognize that for those people, they have their own set of trigger words. And we all have them, we're all human. And once we recognize where they are, we can kind of work to, to speak in a way that we both... It's interesting because we talk about the golden rule. We talk about the idea to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And in communication, it's a little bit different. It's, it's you want to speak to others, not the way you want to be spoken to, but in the way that you empathize with how they want to hear it, how they want to be spoken to. And it's a lot more difficult. It's easy for me to speak about what I think. It's easy for me to speak to others about how I want to communicate. But to think about, for a minute, how the other person wants to be communicated, to change your style to match that, it's, it's a very challenging thing to do, but a very important thing to do in order to maintain trust and cooperation. The third big trap that I have, the one that is probably the kicker of them all, has to do with the way we respond to criticism. Now, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I like to believe sometimes that I'm perfect, but I'm not. And when, I give, when I'm given feedback, and that feedback is not necessarily positive. Uh, it can be hard. It can be challenging for me uh, to accept. Because especially if it's something that I really trust, I'm like, oh, is that, is that really true about me? And I can get into all these weird head spaces about it. So responding to criticism is a really big challenge. And there'll always be criticism out there. My first jobs, I was... Uh, quality assurance manager. I was responsible for the quality management system within the company. And we would have somebody come in every six months and they would audit us. So we had a certification for ISO 9001. And they would come in and they would look at our policies and our procedures and our instructions. And then they would go around and they would interview different employees and see how processes worked. And they would compare what they found with what the written documentation was. And when they found discrepancies, they would issue us statements of nonconformance to me, the quality assurance manager. And a nonconformance meant there was a discrepancy. And sometimes there was a major nonconformance. And that meant that within 30 days there had to be a response. And sometimes there was a minor nonconformance, which you had to fix before their next visit. And then sometimes they would just offer opportunities for improvement. And opportunities for improvement meant you're doing everything okay, but here's some ideas to make things even better. Now, when I would get these major nonconformances, they were at risk of shutting that down to taking away our registration. And I would take them so personally. I'm like, oh, what did I do? How did I mess that up? I'm like the worst quality manager in the world. And my auditor, who was an awesome guy, 
he was seeing how this was affecting me. He was paying attention to my body language. And he said, you know, I want you to change the way you frame this. Because no matter whether I give you a major non-conformance, or a minor non-conformance, or an opportunity for improvement, an OFI, they're all opportunities for improvement. They're all opportunities for how to do things better. Here's some ideas for how to make things better. And yeah, the major ones you need to respond to more quickly. You need to put more attention on. They need to have more priority. But the goal that everybody shares is how can we make things better? How can we identify where things are off? A lot of times, in my experience auditing other people, they're very nervous too. And they get worried that they're going to get fetched up or they're going to get in trouble for something. That auditing is about finding trouble. And when you change your perspective and you think about it, in terms of, I'm giving you feedback so that you can figure out how to make things better in the world that you live in. Then you kind of adopt a different way of responding to criticism. So it's not always easy. It takes a lot of challenge. It takes a lot of forethought. It takes a lot of patience. But it's a different way of looking at things by reframing that criticism as an opportunity for improvement. And in all three, at least for me, it's about managing those emotions. It's about managing those trigger words that make me angry. It's about recognizing when I'm ignoring body language. And it's about taking a deep breath when I receive that criticism and figure out how I'm going to handle that, how I'm going to recognize that, how I'm going to reframe that. And by doing that, as we're facilitating our meetings, by doing that as we're talking, by doing that experimenting to figure out what works in certain situations and what works in others, by establishing that sense of safety, that's what guarantees us success in whatever communication we're having, whatever facilitation session we're having, and whatever meeting we're leaving. So I want to take a few minutes and I wanted to give some further suggestions of reading and listening to. So what inspired this speech was from a podcast I heard about a year ago uh, from Ask the Manager by Allison Green, and it was episode 10, How to Get Your Tone Right in Tricky Work Conversations. And I really enjoyed listening to it, and it sort of inspired this idea around communication and improving our communication. And after that, I dove into this book called Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High. And some of the things that really hit home was this idea of a pool of shared meaning and what it is to have dialogue and some ideas about safety, uh, how to make it safe to talk about almost anything, which was Chapter 5. So a couple of uh, resources there. A few more. Uh, Simon Sinek gives a really good speech on YouTube. You can look it up. It's called Why Good Leaders Make You Feel Safe. And he talks about that same idea of safety and trust and cooperation. And if you have an Audible account, a uh, really good Audible article or story to listen to is called Assertive Confidence Communication Skills, and that's by Lisa Reynolds. So that's four resources that you might want to check out if you want to learn more about safety and trust and communication. Uh, have a great day. Geek. Wisdom. Wisdom.